Have you ever wanted to justify your treatment options with solid, nice guidance but failed to remember the details? Then you're just in the right place. Welcome to the Nice GP YouTube channel, a channel where you will find summarised current nice guidance relevant to primary care. I am Fernando Florido, I'm a GP in the United Kingdom with an interest in diabetes. In this video, I will go through the NICE guideline type 2 diabetes in adults management. I am sure that once you have seen the presentation, you will find it easier to manage diabetic patients according to the guideline. So let's go straight in. This podcast is intended for healthcare professionals who are interested in type 2 diabetes. Without further preamble, let's start this episode. In this episode, we will be discussing the blood glucose management section of the type 2 diabetes NICE guidelines. Right, so in terms of blood glucose management in type 2 diabetes, we will normally measure the HbA1c levels at 3 to 6 monthly intervals until the HbA1c is stable. And then at 6 monthly intervals, once the HbA1c level and the therapy are stable. If HbA1c monitoring is invalid because of disturbed erythrocyte turnover or abnormal hemoglobin type, we will need to estimate the blood glucose control using one of the following either plasma glucose profiles, total glycated hemoglobin estimation, if there is an abnormal hemoglobin, or fructosamine estimation. Now for patients managed either by lifestyle and diet alone, combined with a single drug not association with hypoglycemia, we should aim for an HbA1c level of 48 millimol per mole, or 6.5%. That is for patients on lifestyle and diet alone, or only with one single drug not associated with hypoglycemia. For patients on a drug associated with hypoglycemia, we should aim for an HbA1c level of 53 millimol per mole or 7%. Now, if HbA1c levels on a single drug rise to 58 millimol per mole or 7.5% or higher, we will need to intensify the drug treatment. We also need to consider relaxing the target HbA1c level for patients who are unlikely to achieve longer term risk reduction benefits, for example, people with a reduced life expectancy. Also consider for whom tight blood glucose control poses a high risk of the consequences of hypoglycemia, for example, people who are at risk of falling, who have impaired awareness of hypoglycemia, or people who drive or operate machinery as part of their job. There is separate guidance for women with type 2 diabetes who are pregnant or planning to become pregnant, so we will not cover this in this podcast. In terms of self-monitoring of blood glucose, we should not routinely offer it unless the person is on insulin or another drug that can cause hypoglycemia, or the person is pregnant or planning to become pregnant, or as part of the advice in respect of driving. The DVLA Fitness to Drive has specific guidance for people with type 2 diabetes. There's separate guidance that you can find in the podcast description. But as a simple summary, this guidance states that drivers on glycoside and glenides should practice appropriate glucose monitoring at times relevant to driving. And then group 1 drivers, that's drivers of cars and motorcycles on insulin, should do glucose testing no more than two hours before the start of the first journey and every two hours after driving has started. A maximum of two hours should pass between the pre-driving glucose test and the first glucose check performed after driving has started. More frequent self-monitoring may be required if there's any greater risk of hypoglycemia like physical activity, altered meal routine, etc. For group 2 drivers on insulin, that's drivers of lorries or AGVs, the guidance is very similar to group 1 drivers on insulin, but slightly more stringent, so, so I would advise you to see that particular guidance in more detail. We can also consider short-term monitoring of blood glucose levels when a patient is starting treatment on steroids or to confirm hypoglycemia. If a patient is self-monitoring, then we should carry out a structure assessment at least annually, and the assessment should include the person's self-monitoring skills, the quality and frequency of testing, checking that the person knows how to interpret the blood glucose results and what action to take, the impact on the person's quality of life and the continued benefit of the equipment use. Now, in respect of glucose-lowering drug treatment, we have to remember that if a patient is 
symptomatically hyperglycemic, we will need to consider insulin or a sulfonylurea at that time as rescue therapy and then review the treatment when the blood glucose and symptom control has been achieved. But if the patient is not symptomatic, as initial drug treatment, we will normally offer standard release metformin as the initial drug treatment. We can then increase the dose gradually over several weeks to minimize the risk of gastrointestinal side effects. And if a patient experiences side effects with standard release metformin, we can consider a trial of modified release metformin. We also need to review the dose of metformin if the EGFR is below 45, and we will need to stop it if the EGFR is below 30 or prescribe it with caution if it's between 30 and 45, generally meaning that you prescribe half of the maximum dose. If metformin is contraindicated or not tolerated, the initial drug treatment will be with either a DPP-4 inhibitor or pioglitazone or a sulfonylurea. We need to be aware that repaglinide is both clinically effective and cost-effective. However, the only licensed combination is metformin and therefore no other drug could be offered at first intensification, so that makes it a less good choice. So if metformin is not tolerated, it's either a DPP-4 inhibitor pioglitazone or a sulfonylurea. We need to remember that pioglitazone is associated with an increased risk of heart failure, bladder cancer and bone fracture and therefore we should not offer or continue pioglitazone if a patient has any of the following heart failure, hepatic impairment, diabetic ketoacidosis, history of bladder cancer or macroscopic hematuria. What about SGLT2 inhibitors and GLP mimetics, you may ask? Well, GLP mimetics are not recommended in monotherapy. Treatment with an SGLT2 inhibitor may be appropriate as monotherapy for some patients if metformin is contraindicated or not tolerated. There is separate specific night guidance for this and the summary of this guidance basically says that SGLT2 inhibitors are recommended as monotherapies only if a sulfonylurea or pioglitazone are not appropriate and a DPP-4 inhibitor would otherwise be prescribed. We need to be aware that there is an increased risk of diabetic ketoacidosis with SGLT2 inhibitors. We need to test for raised ketones in patients with acidosis symptoms, even if plasma glucose levels are near normal. Suspicious symptoms are, for example, rapid weight loss, feeling sick or being sick, stomach pains, fast and deep breathing, sleepiness, a sweet smell to the breath, a sweet or metallic taste in the mouth, or a different odour to urine or sweat. The mechanism by by which SGLT2 inhibitors might lead to diabetic ketoacidosis has not been established. We also need to be aware that there is an increased risk of low limb amputation with canaglyphosin, mainly TAUs. The evidence has not shown an increased risk for dapaglyphosin and empaglyphosin, but the risk may be a class effect, so we need to be aware of that. Now, at first intensification of drug treatment, if metformin is not sufficient as monotherapy, we need to consider dual therapy, either metformin and a DPP-4 inhibitor, or metformin and pioglitazone, or metformin and sulfonylurea. If metformin is contraindicated or not tolerated, and initial drug treatment is not sufficient, we will consider dual therapy, either a DPP-4 inhibitor and pioglitazone, a DPP-4 inhibitor and a sulfonylurea, or pioglitazone and sulfonylurea. Now again, what about SGLT2 inhibitors and GLP mimetics? Well, GLP mimetics are not recommended in dual therapy, but SGLT2 inhibitors may be appropriate in combination with metformin for some patients. Specific NICE guidance says they should only be used if a sulfonylurea is contraindicated or not tolerated and the person is at significant risk of hypoglycemia. However, SGLT2 inhibitors are not recommended in dual therapy if metformin is not tolerated or contraindicated. At second identification of drug treatment, that is, if dual therapy with metformin and another drug is not enough, we need to consider either triple therapy or starting insulin. And triple therapy would be either metformin, DPP-4 inhibitor and a sulfonylurea, or metformin, pioglitazone and a sulfonylurea. 
So again, what about SGLT2 inhibitors and GLP mimetics? Well, SGLT2 inhibitors in triple therapy have their own guidance and they're recommended as an option for treating type 2 diabetes in combination with either metformin and a sulfonylurea or metformin and paglitazone, although this is only canaglyphosin and empaglyphosin, not dapaglyphosin. So SGLT2 inhibitors are not recommended with DPP4 inhibitors. So you can have metformin, sulfonylurea and SGLT2 inhibitor, or you can have metformin, paglitazone, and then either empaglyphosin or canaglyphosin, but not dapaglyphosin. If triple therapy with metformin and two other drugs is not enough, we can consider combination therapy with metformin, sulfonylurea and a GLP-1 mimetic, but only for patients who have a BMI of 35 or higher, adjusting for people from black, Asian or other minority ethnic groups, and specific problems associated with obesity, or they have a BMI lower than 35, but for whom insulin would have occupational implications or weight loss would benefit other conditions. But we can only continue GLP-1 mimetic therapy if there's a reduction of at least 11 millimol per mole or 1% in HbA1c level and a weight loss of at least 3% of initial body weight in six months. So this is all for patients who can tolerate reforming. So if you tolerate metformin, you go on to triple therapy and that's not enough. You can use an SGLT2 as long as it's not with a DPP4 inhibitor. And if that's not enough, then you can use metformin, a sulfonylurea and a GLP mimetic with certain conditions. However, if metformin is contraindicated or not tolerated, and if dual therapy is not sufficient, then we need to go straight to insulin. We also need to remember that we can only offer a GLP-1 mimetic in combination with insulin with specialist care advice and ongoing support. In respect of insulin-based treatments, when starting insulin therapy, we need to use active insulin dose titration with patient education, including the DVLA requirements, continuing telephone support and management of acute changes in plasma glucose, including hypoglycemia. When starting insulin, we can continue to offer metformin, but we need to review the continued need for other blood glucose lowering drugs. We can start insulin from a choice of a number of insulin types. We can offer NPH insulin injected once or twice daily according to need. We can consider starting both NPH and short anti insulin, particularly if the person's HbA1c is 75 millimol per mole or 9% or above, either administered separately or a pre mixed or biphasic human insulin preparation. We can also consider as an alternative to NPH insulin using insulin detamir or insulin glargine in certain situations, that is, only if the use of insulin detamir or glargine would reduce the frequency of injections from twice to once daily, or there is recurrent hypoglycemia. We can also consider premixed or biphasic preparations that include short-acting insulin analogues rather than preparation that includes short-acting human insulin if a person prefers injecting insulin immediately before a meal or if hypoglycemia is a problem or if blood glucose levels rise markedly after meal. We can also consider switching to insulin detamir or glargine from NPH insulin if there is significant hypoglycemia or if a patient cannot use the NPH device but could use insulin analogue devices. We need to monitor patients on a basal insulin regime, NPH insulin, detamir or glargine, for the need of short-acting insulin before meals, including premixed by basic insulin. And also we need to monitor patients on premixed by basic insulin for the need of a further injection of short hunting insulin before meals or for a change to a basal bolus regimen. For guidance on insulin delivery for patients with type 2 diabetes, there is separate guidance in the relevant section of the NICE guideline on type 1 diabetes. But in summary, in terms of insulin delivery, what it says is that we need to allow access to the device the patients prefer. We need to provide patients who have special visual or psychological needs with injection devices or needle-free systems that they can use independently. We need to offer needles of different lengths to patients with problems such as 
pain, local skin reaction and injection site leakages. We need to provide patients with suitable containers for collecting used needles and other sharps. And finally, we need to check the condition of injection sites at least annually and if new problems with blood glucose control occur. This is the end of this episode of the Diabetes in Primary Care podcast. You can find it on your favourite podcast provider. You will also be able to find links to the guidelines mentioned in the podcast description. Thank you for listening.